Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is AJ Lewis. AJ is the CEO of Sphere Breaks, a company that makes a spherical break for the defense industry. AJ, welcome to the pod. Thank you, sir. Great to be here. Good to have you, sir. I'm happy you were able to make it on. Yes. Plus, this is the uh, third. This is actually the third reschedule. So we finally pulled it off. And wasn't easy. <laughs> we did rain, it. Rain the whole way down from Erie, and uh, the traffic was particularly bad today in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I'm happy you made it in person, though. Like the in person episodes are always better. Yeah. yeah. And uh, these, maybe it's like 60% local, 40% remote with these. And. I like the in-person ones because like you get to hang out and like yeah, grab a yeah. meal. And, exactly, you know, exactly. Yeah, it's more uh, more human. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so I'll still drink on the remote ones, but uh, you know, it's uh, better to to share whiskey in person. Yes, yeah. <laughs> not drinking alone. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, how'd you get in the brakes business? Um, not. Of the auto industry, actually, so uh, just more of an ideas guy, and the whole uh, brake technology concept came about as a idea that I had actually prior to uh, deploying to Iraq. Uh, I was in college, um, and again, had a lot of ideas growing up, uh, and had an art background growing up. I was into painting and woodworking and stuff like that Badass. so always working on that stuff and uh, grew up racing motocross so I was always rebuilding motors and so I had the tool side figured out the hardware side putting stuff together and seeing how things work um, but it it kind of just kind of came out of nowhere as an idea of a um, ball that you know intrinsically when you you know hold a ball that you have more surface area coverage with a smaller effective diameter and you could create more torque out of that. So the very initial renderings of the drawings, which I actually still have, it was in a notebook I took um, overseas, was putting a ball inside of a cylinder because I rebuilt a lot of motors and understood how a cylinder went together. Yeah. So to like cut the uh, patent, uh, trail was let, let's just put it inside of like a cylinder thing and then just have cups compress around um, the ball with a drive shaft through the ball right so it's literally just you know cups on either side of this ball that had a shaft through it interesting um, so the cylinder <laughs> you were um, running like basically through the ends of it that's your shaft right you probably had bearings Plan yep. to go into that. Yeah, then, I had bearings and then some seals for the cups, uh, which were the friction surfaces, uh, and then dogs to hold the housings together. So it cool. literally was a a cylinder, a motor cylinder, motorcycle cylinder, whatever is what I had in my mind because I built a lot of them and then threw the ball inside. Instead of a piston, it was a ball with a shaft through it. Yeah. Um, like a drive shaft. So, um, and then went through, cool, you know, did the tour in Iraq and then. When I got back, I was able to patent it. Uh, I had to, you know, have a full time job because it wasn't mature enough to uh, fund any, to, to you know, fuel my life. So, um, worked with uh, several folks up in Erie. The first guy I was introduced to was uh, a guy named B.J. Lechner, who, in a former life, was running Dana Corporation. Dana was a huge aftermarket brake company. Cool. And they had a big presence in Erie. Um, and he had sold, or Dana was sold to Affinia Holdings in Chicago, and he still had a lot of great connections. Um, so when I showed up to the chamber, the Erie Chamber, um, right after Iraq, and I had this, I literally, I didn't even have prototypes, I had paper, like sheets and drawings. Um, he, he immediately said, hey, 
you should try and put these on cars. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, how do I do that? Cause I, I didn't have any background in the auto industry. Um, so he's like, well, I'm going to connect you to the guys in Chicago and uh, we'll, we'll set up a presentation. You guys, you can go there and present it to him. So he sets this up and I, ha I, for prototypes, my pitch, I flew to Chicago with foam balls, three inch foam balls and 12 inch plates, plastic plates. I had no idea who I was meeting. I didn't, I didn't get an agenda or anything. So fly to Chicago from Erie and I go to affiliate one of their main headquarters and the uh, vice president of the company greeted me in the lobby. And then we go in to this conference room and it was uh, this huge room that had a big kind of U-shaped uh, um, table and there was like 12, 12 13 uh, senior executives Right, so it was, um, you know, vice president of disc brakes, vice president of drum brakes, um, vice president of our, our research and development. Um, That's your guy. Chassis, right, yeah. <laughs> all of them. And the, the, I'm like, okay, I can handle this. I just came back from Iraq, so I'm tough. I'm going to do this. Nice. I, I was shit my pants the whole time, but of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the first thing I said, this is my pitch. I didn't even have a deck. The first thing I said is, I'm not here to insult your intelligence. Just roll with me. So. I pass out all the plates and I say, okay, hold this plate in your hand and the next, the person next to you try and turn it. So I, I turn it like that's a disc break, right? We can all agree that's a disc break, right? And they're all like, what are we doing here? Right. <laughs> um, but then I pass around the three inch balls, send them around and I say, hold that in your hand and have someone try and turn that ball in your hand. And, and they, it was a lot, noticeably a lot harder to try and turn that. Nice. I said, that's a sphere break. It's, you can generate more power with a smaller break effective diameter and cover greater surface area. Their minds were blown. They're that's like, awesome. oh my God. And it literally went on for two hours of all of the different applications the sphere break could be applied to. That ours. Numerous times the president had to reel everyone back. Like, oh no, we shouldn't be talking about that. You know, like it, there was that, you know, thing of confidentiality. Great, great session. Great meeting. Um, and, uh, so it, it was, it was, that was like a huge milestone. So I, I was able to take everything, you know, there's, there's a lot of you, you there, here's all the reasons why this will never work, why you can never pull this off. There was a lot of that. Um, and so that was kind of like my action item list. So I, I took all of that back to Erie. Um, and then it just so happened that, uh, Ben Franklin, technology partners had a uh, office right next to um, BJ's office. And, you know, he's like, Hey, we did some market validation in the market says, yes, even though there's a million things why this will never go, <laughs> they got really excited. Right. So then we were able to um, get some early seed funding from Ben Franklin tech partners. Uh, I'm talking like uh, low thousands just to like vet some things out. So the first thing we did, was we took the concept to Carnegie Mellon University, the supercomputing center. Um, and we were able to simulate a million times over, you know, a small sphere break with a standard 11 and a half inch disc break for an F-150 application. Uh, everyone understands what an F-150 is, so that's kind of why we did it early on. Yeah. Um, we just changed one geometry, at, like one thing at a time. We would change the material, we would change the angle, the angles, we would change the diameters, just little things at a time. The results we got back on pressure and torque were blowing the disc brake out of the water. Awesome. So then I got to go back to Ben Franklin and say, hey, results look really good at a very reputable institution. Um, I need some more money to make one. And then I can, when we make one, we're going to take it to Detroit and get it tested. So we uh, raised uh, like another like 20, 30,000 um, and made two prototypes and took those to Link Engineering in Detroit. Very reputable, like world-renowned, very reputable test company uh, in the auto industry. And we tested the brake on an F-150 dyno. And the results matched what we saw in the supercomputer. It's like nice. really great torque curves for the pressure in. 
and it was at that point we knew we had something big. That's awesome. Uh, so then I was able to start the path of like going down the fundraising route and taking an honest look at what I'm doing with my life. And do we go in all, all in on this or do I continue down the military path, the, the um, leadership path uh, with a fortune 10 company or, you know, so um, obviously I chose sphere breaks. That's why we're here. <laughs> <Bad ass. laughs> we're doing good. So, so yeah. What were, that's an awesome story, by the way. And I, I love where you were able to bring those spheres and those plates into that. Yeah. That, you know, looking back, that was so ballsy, but yeah, ballsy, uh, <laughs> embarrassing, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> but it, like it did the it job. Work. It did the yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. super naive. I think that's a better term. <laughs> it's the, uh, the kind of bravado only the naive can possess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, the other thing I want to know is, like, what were some of the things you learned when you tried to make the first one physically? Like, what were, like, you must have had a few, like, iterations to dial that in, I would imagine. Yeah, um, we figured it out pretty quickly. We worked with a great company up in Erie called Zebra Forum that was uh, working in, you know, coinciding with uh, Navitech Machining. And so the design folks were in with the machining folks, so they had a great relationship um, we already had a good idea what it's going to look like and how it's going to go together. So it was just a matter of getting through that um, first iteration, making sure all the nuts and bolts come together and yeah. it actually functions. Was that still the cylinder design you were talking yeah, about? Okay, yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. The very first um, sphere break. There's two of them. One is still at Navitech um, and one is in my office. Um, and it, it's basically a big cylinder with a sphere inside and then a drive shaft through it and some hydraulic lines to the pistons and that's it um, could you have a sphere clutch i wonder like that oh yeah seems yeah like we so design. we just got our motorcycle patent and um that's very applicable to that application um what what and we kind of talked about this earlier tonight it's so easy to go down so many shiny objects like <laughs> wherever there are brakes there are sphere brakes like it, it it doesn't matter. We're going to be able to compete in any kind of segment. And, awesome. um, we've, we've done that. Uh, we're, you know, focused right now. Um, so, but, uh, yeah. Can you talk about some of the vehicles you're deploying this on right now? Yeah. So we're testing it on Marine Corps amphibious combat vehicle. We've already done track testing on army striker on the MTV one P two, which cool. is like your standard troop carrier. Uh, we've also scaled it to other military vehicles, um, that, didn't make it as far as track testing because it was the first use cases. And then as we got through those use cases, the army and Marine Corps, are like just let's more focus, let, let's focus more narrowly on where we need it now versus where we would like to have it later. Yeah. It makes sense. So, so they want to get it to production on a select number. Of right. That makes then, the biggest impact first. And then, you yeah, know. makes sense. Yep. So what's that like from a maintenance perspective? Like, I mean, do you, what's your, what's your wear component on a sphere break? Yeah. So right now, I mean, you know, backing up the main reason why we, uh, are, you know, the, the main reason why the department of defense is so interested in our technology in, in uh, there are other civilian components to it too, but it's because we designed it to change brake pads without removing wheels or tools. So you can literally change a brake pad on the vehicle so with no infrastructure with no infrastructure. So, so it clamps from the sides now or how is, how is the present? No, it's same thing. It's, you know, we have our uh, calipers that are concentric to the rotor and there's pistons and everything in there. Um, when the pads wear out, you just pull a pin and then you can uh, pull a spacer plate, which is the uh, curve of the rotor. So it yeah. takes that up. So if you have, you know, friction material on the inside of the rotor, yeah. it's not going to get caught between the piston and the rotor surface. Awesome. And you can pull it right out. And as you pull it out, the piston retracts. So what was it like uh, like joining the Army? Like when did you decide to do that? And um, what was some of your career like in that, that realm like? I had no plan. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, growing up, we always played G.I. Joe's in the sandbox. And, you know, uh, I, I really didn't have a plan for life. Like I was, I was good at a lot of different things. And I had to really make a decision what I wa really want to do. I honestly, you know, in, in my senior year, I was like, man, I really not sure what I'm going to get a degree in or anything. Um, so I enlisted like right after high school. I, I actually may have been in high school when I enlisted into the military. And then it wasn't until I, I toured some campuses uh, that 
in North Carolina. I was down in North Carolina at the time. That was like, man, I really want to do this program. Like, I, I, I like building things. I like designing things. North Carolina is like the mecca for furniture. Like the whole, you know, industry is, you know, born from North Carolina. Did not know that. Um, and there were some really amazing programs a long time ago. One of the last designs, furniture design schools was at East Carolina University. And so I was like, I'm going to apply here and see if I can get in. Um, and it played into my art background. So cool. um, I got into the school. Once I was in, I started seeing these posters of like dudes jumping out of airplanes and all this stuff. And with like the motocross background, I was into like the adrenaline stuff. And I was like, man, what is this? You know, and strategically done it led me right to the recruiter's office like i just kept walking and checking out these posters and it like led me right to the uh, recruiter's office <clears throat> at the time this so i enlisted and i didn't go to basic training yet i still had long hair like really long hair i uh mine was down to was, my shoulders in high school yeah yeah i was uh in rock bands and everything and the first thing the recruiter said I wasn't even recruited. She's like, don't come back in here unless all of that hair is gone. Fucking seriously? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And What's that got to do with anything? I have no idea. But I was, for some reason, it hit me like, oh, man, I kind of want to be a part of this. You know, I don't know why. It was, it she was, negged you. Yeah. And so <laughs> I got my hair cut. Worst decision of my life on the, on the, on the front end because, you know, when you have a full head of hair, your, your top, the, the skin's so sensitive. So, you know, we cut it all off and, oh man, I got fried. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> my, my head got fried. Um, yeah, dude, I'm experiencing that constantly because uh, I've got this fucking dome. <laughs> yeah. It's a sphere uh, break. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I did it and then I, I went in and they're like, yeah, this is ROTC. Uh, and um, it, it, here's the path. Uh, you got you to gotta do all of this additional schoolwork on top of you know, all this additional training and everything else on top of your degree. And I'm um, like, all right, sign me up. So I did it and became really good at that. And, Cause I was just focused. Like I, this is what I want to do. I, I had no other plan, and but I kept like tinkering school for furniture. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. It was awesome. It was a great uh, program. Very challenging. If you made it challenging. Uh, it, so I don't even know if, I don't know how other design schools work, but how this one particularly worked was, you'd be given an assignment like, Hey, you got to build a table. It could be functional or non-functional. Um, what does a non-functional table look like? Just, you know, artsy fartsy, you know, like something like you that you can't like put, it? yeah, you can't put anything on it. You know, <laughs> how is that? A t like, you know, if, a, if to me, honestly, I, I, clapping, I, I yeah. totally hated when they would do that because the students that weren't good would do the non-functional because they weren't good enough to make something functional. Yeah. Same in sculpture. Like there were a lot of students. I went through a sculpture program there. There were a lot of students that would do like really uh, f pieces that made no sense, and they would claim, "Oh, it's artsy." You know, it's like the, it means this. It means this mood. This is the mood I was feeling. And I'm like, you look at some of the greatest sculptors of all time. My favorite is Bernini. Like just the skin tone in a marble sculpture where you know, a hand is pressing against an arm or a leg and it looks like skin, but it's marble. Yeah. That is true artwork. This garbage you have <laughs> is nothing. And you're skating by and you're probably going to get a B or C just so you could pass art school. But I, yeah. yeah, there's a couple of us that like really hammered the students that just did not like try and actually make functional stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so. Two things. One is we should get pictures of the stuff if you have it I have, and splice it in. Yeah, actually, cool. my senior project, my senior design pictures project. pictures of the shitty ones so we could show those? No, too. I wish I did. <laughs> They're not worthy. Um, <laughs> no, my senior design was a billiard room. I built an entire billiard table Seriously? with a table, a uh, coffee table, wall table with an inlaid uh, hand um, sculpted uh, relief of a, of a billiard cue stick going through um, uh, felt hitting a ball out nice. of aluminum. That's awesome. This is really cool. So, um, yeah, that was my senior project. That's and, really cool. Uh, it, but I'm going to tell you, my first piece of furniture sucked. Like yeah. They were just bad. Well, when I was going to robot school, um, <laughs> and before robot school, when I was going for computer science and business, 
I would make friends with the industrial design students. Like they were my favorite people to hang out with. Like there was one of them who I'm still friends with, Ariel Eisen, who's been on the podcast and now is making ruggedized buckles for the adventure sport industry. Um, oh man. He's cool. You'd like him. Um, but those guys were really fun to hang out with him and I would brew beer together. Um, yeah. like, um, and you know, there was, uh, I'll tell you a story afterward, but like, you know, the bunch of interesting, like, startup ideas they had and um you know like um all, all of them loved furniture like it was it was inter and, and like pocket knives was like another designer trope like everybody loved you know like a kershaw or a spider co knife oh nice yeah that yeah was, that's was, awesome yeah it was, it was a fun fun group of folks Ariel and I would brew beer, and I remember, um, and we also <laughs> embezzled like four hundred dollars from the CMU Box Club in order to build. Um, we called it Scratch Still, that, Carl. <laughs> Stilltron, yeah. <laughs> we to build a robotic still to brew <laughs> moonshine with. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's fine. It's, it's not awesome. statute of limitations. I think That's we're right. okay. Yep. But um, yeah, no, I mean, good, good. Good people, good folks, really, really fun uh, kind of getting into the design project. And I had more friends that were designers than roboticists when I graduated, which is why when I first started SKA, we were making user interfaces for robots rather than, you know, yeah. the stuff we're doing now, like perception engineering and mechatronics and yeah. all that stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I didn't mean to hog it. I just I <laughs> no, that's felt great. some relation coming on. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. I'm so. oh, sorry. After you. No, that yeah, that, that was that was a fun part. But the like the 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 um, getting back to the curriculum. Yeah. So it would be like you got to build something, okay? You have thirty days to do it. You have to design it yourself. You have to make it yourself. You have to finish it. Like like in thirty days, and then it, and then there would be sales like you where you have to sell. Oh, that's right? kind of cool. So wait, do you actually have to sell them? Like people would have to buy it, or like you know, like mock it was. Um, it, it, there, buying that, that was like super loose. About. That was super loose. Uh, they would always have art sales and stuff where you were supposed to put your artwork up and sell it. Buy another one? Um, yeah, a little bit. So that was a challenging part because not everything sold, right? So um, and some of the stuff is, you know, no one's going to buy it. Yeah, uh, yeah. What 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 would sell? Some Some people would put sellable things in there just for the sake of making some money because we were all starving artists. And it was like... The biggest things would be cutting boards. Like they're easy to make. You can crank out a million of them and everyone likes them and everyone uses them. So those were like the hot sellers at the sales. Wood, UHMW, like, like what were you, what were you making them out of? Uh, everything, uh, hardwoods, softwoods, um, the billiard table I made was made out of walnut ash and nice. panga panga, which is from Africa. That's awesome. Is uh, panga panga. I think to this day is still the hardest wood in in the world like i i don't know if it was um i may be lying there but it's basically 50 pounds per cubic foot so Holy it's really shit. heavy and very dense we uh, actually, actually burned a cubic foot's pretty big though i don't think it, that's that ridiculous it yeah. is um it's just really heavy like a lot of hardwoods are not that heavy they're heavy but they're not that heavy it's yeah, pretty heavy sense. it's very dense um and i think we burned up a few blades in the shop and a lot <laughs> of people were pissed that i did that but I mean, you got to spend work, money to make money. We'll, we'll put the work on the videos. Yeah. It really looks really good. That's awesome. Bandsaw blades? Like, what were you what were you using to fab this stuff? I imagine a multitude of tools. So the, what was nice is the shop was there. It's not like we had to furnish our own shop tools. Um, if you wanted to do special things, you would have to make your own fixtures and stuff like that. Um, there's uh, numerous uh, students that made f guitars, like acoustic guitars, flamenco guitars, and they were really high quality nice that's guitars. awesome but they had to make their own stuff so if you want to make it you got to make your own to support it what they did what the school provided was a shop so you had band saws table saws joiners planers you know router tables all nice that. so sounds like a good little wood shop it was awesome yeah yeah the the field robotics center had a wood shop that was pretty fun we had uh table saw we had one of those saw stops we had a paint booth. Uh, we oh, had that's a couple awesome. of band saws. We did yeah. not have a paint. That would have been great. We were just pff, getting high off the fumes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what you, the trick is you if it's small enough, you find an Amazon box. Yeah. And then you take it outside and mm -hmm. you put it in the grass and you try to hit the box. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, that's yeah. the tactic. Yep. Yeah, we did a lot of the big stuff out there. It's just, um, yeah. So you we must did, have just did. had like paint covered grass, basically, I would imagine. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yep. 
a lot of it, a lot of the stuff was uh, brushed on though. Yeah. A lot of the finishes, uh, the, we just didn't have that great of ventilation. Well, the design students were good with a rattle can <laughs> that I knew. Like, I mean, those motherfuckers like knew how to not lay it on too thick. I would always get the um, the legs, like, because I would put too much on and it oh, would yeah. start to drip down. But the people I hired that had gone through the Carnegie Mellon School of Design um, were like really good at like just layering it really thin, waiting the right amount of time, putting a little more paint on, sanding. We like just patient. Yeah, we would never use cans. It was always traditional finishes, so everything was usually brushed on or sponged on or wiped on. Oh, that's cool. Um, and the best finishes were like fourteen layer finishes. So wow, really deep color, deep look. Um, shellacs are really good soft amber shellacs are good for cherry because it really as the cherry ages it gets more and more red and oh, cool. it looks really yeah it really pops cherry so. colored and mahogany like a like a, a amber shellac on a cherry or on a mahogany really brings the color of the mahogany out that's awesome so you're making me want to refurnish everything I own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, I've yeah, got we're, no We're game. talking, and I'm yeah. like, man, you know what? i got to buy some shop tools again. <laughs> i got to yeah. get back in. I haven't touched anything in for years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got, um, in my apartment, I've got like a little shop. I have a table saw, a laser cutter, a band saw. Um, you know, I mean, all my tools are kind of spread around town with different office yep. locations. And so, yeah, uh, drill press, just the basics. I mean... It's it's hard to justify like going all in on like a Bridgeport J head or like, you know, well not all in. It's like three grand. But like well, when the robotics the company takes off, yeah. you're gonna have you're gonna have to have the wood shop to yeah. support prototyping and fabricating. That's how you prototype your robots. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about it, I, I don't I don't like investing in tools in real estate. Like I'd much rather have people. Yeah, that's right. Like to yeah. me, that's you know, yeah. you can always order parts from a machine shop, and somebody yep. else has got the real estate and the tools. And, and yeah, and the expertise, current yeah. current expertise, but like best practices. I would rather have the people, and you know, partner up with like quick turn shops that are really really good at. Like yep. <laughs> right now, we're having a, um, like as we speak, they're probably working on it. Like we're getting some parts made. We got the prints in um, at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, nine a.m. I got the PO in at lunchtime because uh, they didn't quote it out until then. And then I texted the president of the company um, that was doing the fabrication. And then he texts me back five minutes later. We're cutting it now. <laughs> like, wow. And then either we're going to send a guy to pick it up or they're going to send a guy to drop it off tomorrow. Oh, man, that's so, awesome. Yeah. So yeah. it's like you don't need to have that in house. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's just for fun. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I get that. I mean, like, I've inspected bridge ports for people that wanted to buy them just as a favor to a friend and because it's mm -hmm. a neat world. And I've spent probably, like, you know, over a 1,000 hours on milling machines, and, and I love spending time in shops, and I did woodworking as a kid. And I mean, not, like, crazy billiard tables made out of... Um, yeah, panga panga. Panga panga. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, it's, you know, like uh, made a house find neighbor's cat, like way more lame than the shit that you devoted serious years like, of your life. Like I to. said, it started off really ugly. Things just did not go well. That's how you but learn. In three like, years, we had, we had good stuff. So yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I I put out like a LinkedIn post recently where I I posted a video where someone was talking about like just traumatizing experiences as a roboticist. So like lighting robots on fire and like. <laughs> Just fucking up, basically, because you don't know any better when you're a kid. And so you, you don't put an emergency stop on it. Or I had an 80-kilogram robot almost break my arm. It, it went mm. across the street here. We're working on it in the space when it looked very different. And um, I didn't have an emergency stop on it because oh. they didn't teach people that in school. And I was yeah. a recent graduate. And I, all my robots have emergency stops now. <laughs> I had to chase this thing across the street. <laughs> I had to jump on it. I had to pin it down. Luckily, it didn't break my arm because oh it was it was strong enough to oh, hurt yeah. me. Yeah, it doesn't know. It's yeah, dumb. Exactly, it's dumb. <laughs> and like I'm pretty frail, and so you know, it, it luckily it kind of got stuck, you know, in, in a certain position, <laughs> and I was able to pin it for long enough Just to pull, pull a the master disconnect. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, but like I almost got seriously hurt, and oh, after man. that, all my robots have emergency stops. <laughs> And and I got some shit for posting about that because somebody was like, you know, well, as a machine builder, I just know to do that. And I'm like, well, how'd you learn that? And he's like, well, 
I learned it from another person. They learned yeah. it from another person. And that Tribal person knowledge. almost broke their arm. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, Tribal go, knowledge. If you go back far enough, you get to the guy that almost broke their arm. And like roboticists should listen to machine builders because machine builders have all this tribal knowledge. I'm like, you're right. There's machine builders I am friends with that I talk to that I like one of my mentors I've been talking to for eight years is a machine builder. And I love that guy. And he has transmitted so much knowledge to me. And when I tell him about any engineering problem, he's seen it before in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And he can give me ideas on how to do it. And, you know, I love and that. what's great is they love that conversation for because sure. Because it kind of built like those guys are so a lot of the same stuff every day, you know, and when they get the chance to try and solve something outside the box, they just jump all over it. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> That's completely true. Um, I always say the day I quit learning is the day I quit R and D. So yeah, that's yeah, that's a fair statement yeah. for sure. So what's been some of the journey going into production? Like, what's it like going from like somebody sort of creative who makes sketches of cylinders with spheres in them, like you know, in Iraq, to like you know, trying to put a product you know into you know yeah, so high scale manufacturing. So fortunately, you know, ha before I launched Sphere Breaks, I was, you know, working uh, full time at GE. So having the manufacturing background on how big companies should work and operate and all the quality that goes behind it and, you know, focus on the customer, on time delivery, cost, all that stuff. I literally pulled all that knowledge into Sphere. And cool. the very first thing, the very first hire was my lean leader, who was also uh, one of my employees at GE. So nice. he did really great work um, for the businesses we were running. And, uh, you know, it was a tough, challenging environment. And we, we just delivered really great product projects uh, within that um, business vertical. And, you know, that like, we, okay, we're, we're starting this company. Let's do it right. Like there's no bureaucracy. There's no history. We're not changing anything. We're writing the script. So from day one, it's all lean, it's all quality, you know, safety, delivery, right? So um, we took all of our knowledge we learned, different businesses, because he didn't also, you know, he, he and I left the company about the same time, but it took me three years before I could hire him. Yeah. So he went and became a quality guy, quality leader actually at a, another manufacturing company in Erie, Pennsylvania. Cool. And I just kept in touch with him because I was like, I'm, I'm going to work with this guy at I some do that point, too. <laughs> you know, um, and There's a then, lot of people I got my eye on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you, you're not ready yet, but or, or, I'm not ready yet. But when I'm ready, I'm going to be hitting you up. Right. Um, so anyways, so that was that was at the beginning. Right. So um, and we were always one of our keys to success is that we incubate within a manufacturing facility. So any challenge we have with production or manufacturing, anything, we just go out to the shop floor. Those guys have. 40, 50 years plus knowledge of putting things together. So it's like, okay, this is what I'm good at. I got the technology, got the product. I can, I can lead and manage the project and stuff. Find this, just like we just talked about, you find the people that have the, you know, 10,000, uh, you know, what is it? Hours of experience, uh, expertise, professionalism to do that thing. And, um, that's what we've leveraged, right? So I know my lane and my weaknesses and strengths. My guys know their lane, their weaknesses and strengths. And then for anything, uh, any of those gaps, we just fill them with who we got. So right now we're incubating in um, a hundred thousand square foot facility, our business partner affiliate, Red Dog Industries that have uh, uh, amazing machinists uh, in capacity for us to continue to mature the production line. That is a sweet so, deal. It is. It, it is amazing. Uh, and we are forever grateful and humble. And we only succeed because of that relationship. Um, so I, I encourage anyone who's out there developing a product that casts a shadow to, to look at, you know, tying up with facilities that have some space that you can incubate in so that you can posture big and have that expertise and brain power, but remain super lean yeah. to be, you know, cost efficient. It is great to be able to to do that and be cost and creative with like, yeah. you know where you. That's a clever way to do it to incubate it, it's, a manufacturing it's, facility. Yeah, it's and it's not for everyone, and not every arrangement is going to be that way, yeah. and not everyone's going to be that generous. I, I, again, I'm I'm grateful. Well, for, there's probably chemistry. I would imagine you get yeah. along well with them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're there. We're living with them. You know, every day, spending hours with them, and um, 
do projects, do problem solve together. That's really where the bonding occurs. Is, yeah. Hey, we got this challenge. That's totally true. You really get to know somebody when you're in the trenches with yeah. them on a difficult problem. Yeah. Like I always feel like I don't really know someone like until I've, I've worked with them on a, on a, you know, against a tight timeline under tumultuous circumstances. Yep. And that's when you really know, like, if you can trust someone, you know, what they're made of, like, where they really shine, you know, like, can you it guys is. tolerate each other under those yeah. high pressure situations? Yeah. Yep. It, yeah, it's all about having that good fit character. Like, I don't think I would problems. hire somebody, like, as an employee that I hadn't had as a contractor first, like, or, like, at least work it's tough. in some capacity. Yeah, it's tough um, to do that. We've actually partnered up with a, a really cool program that Navy's got, the Navy Talent Pipeline Program, which is like a set of tools and processes and good leadership that helps any company doing business with the government at this point figure out how to attract and retain talent from different pipelines. The best talent really is from within, you know, like, hey, my brother needs a job. I know you're a great person and employee. Let's bring him in or Hey, my sister or my daughter, they're, they're coming out of school. You know, you've been with us for 10 years. I can rely that, you know, the retention is going to be there. So yeah, like, well, really, you're not going to recommend a schmuck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's great. Uh, you, yeah, you definitely learn a lot when things go sideways, even about yourself. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I told you like, um, <clears throat> Last weekend, I worked like a nine and a half hour day, which isn't that much. Like that was the shift we did. And then I went home and I worked more for like a few more hours. Mm -hmm. and other stuff. But we we worked like nine and a half hours on this project. And then we all high fived and said, this was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fletcher it's... working with you on a Saturday. Like yeah. everybody was happy to have done it and proud. Yeah. And, and we all made good money. And like it was nice. You know? Yeah. We all, we all fist bumped. And, you know. Yeah. There's um, we make it a point to celebrate the victories no matter how small yeah because you're you know as as you develop tech it's going to fail like failure yeah i this is one of the things i say a lot is um failure you know people say failure is not an option right it's fucking bullshit failure is guaranteed without question failure Accurate. is guaranteed yeah. guaranteed it's just what do you learn from it and how do you progress yeah. and move forward? There's that meme on LinkedIn, right, where it shows, like, you know, what differentiates successful people from unsuccessful. And it's like the success the unsuccessful person just has a pile of bricks that say failure on their head and the successful person's building a staircase out of failures. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like walking yeah. up it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like, yeah. it's, yeah, you just got to build on it. And that's that's exactly how it works. So yeah, I completely agree. <clears throat> But, um, yeah, we've, uh, I mean, we've had our fair share of failures. What's really cool is when you have the opportunity to fail with people you don't, that are not your employees. So, you know, we're testing brakes on military vehicles, overcoming some crazy challenges and things that people have never experienced before. Even the Department of Defense hasn't had to solve some How of the problems. How much does a striker weigh? Uh, striker is, uh, 60 some thousand pounds holy fucking shit so i would imagine when you brake check that that's a ton of stress six wheels right if i'm not mistaken. it's eight wheels eight wheels yeah. okay yeah the wheel the wheel loads is a lot um it's not the heaviest one there's heavier military vehicles like the acv is heavier than that one that we're testing on um but there's challenges in the peripherals, like you put your technology on and then, hey, that might impact this peripheral, that one. So you have to kind of work through that. What's really exciting is when you show your passion behind what you're trying to do, it's contagious. And they will, no matter what kind of attitude they have, they will be in the fight with you. Like, yeah, let's figure yeah. this out. And we got the I opportunity. Well. Yeah. Every now and then you'll get someone who's just like, oh, Jesus. We I call that a toxic that. personality. Yeah. yeah. And, and then they kind of get shimmied away. But um, yeah, or fired. Yeah, one or the other. Yeah. Um, Sometimes you got a term. That's right. Uh, but it was, I mean, we there were some brilliant mechanics we got to work with solving some crazy problems that haven't been solved before. And awesome. that was that was cool. And it was contagious. That's so. Yeah. Those guys are the best. Like, I love a, just a smart technician that, that knows how to fit anything to anything else. Yeah. You know, or yeah. And, they, and here's the, the thing. A, a lot of them... 
some of the best ones we've worked with initially hated what we were doing <laughs> because it was, no, this is how it works. What are you doing? Why are you messing up my vehicle? Right. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then you like kind of go through it and walk through the paces and like, Oh, wait, well, wait a minute. This is actually kind of cool. Right. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's all, it's a constant, you're not just selling to your customers. You're selling to, you know, the users, you sell to everyone. Those are know? all customers in my mind. I, it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is. Yep. <clears throat> uh, but for sure. I mean, like the stakeholders are interested. Like, this is going to sound bad, but I, I had a professor when I was an undergrad in business school and he was the business economics. He said, so anyway, he would say there are no morals. There are only interests. And so I, I always kind of like that. Like, you know, yeah, that's... and maybe there are no morals, but like, I mean, I have my own morals. You have your morals. Like I yeah. don't want to be a jerk or do things that hurt people because, you know, I have my set of things I think are right, but my morals might conflict with your morals. Like you might, everyone's got, you yeah. know, I, I'm a, I'm a devout Christian, but I can get along with anyone. Correct. Yeah. I, 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 I get I'm along, atheist, I can, I get along yeah. with anyone. It like, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, everyone's going to have their beliefs and yeah. whatever, you know, it's, yeah, there's no problem with that. Yeah. And that's how, honestly, that's how we progress. For sure. No, I mean, <laughs> that's like, and you know, like there's all these, there are two types of people arguments, but I feel like one of them is like, there's people that can coexist with other people regardless of, you know, their race, creed, or religion. Yes. And then there's people just, that Just are be a good human being. Dicks. Dick and not a dick. Those are the two categories. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just be a good human being. Yeah, That's exactly. It. That's yeah. it. Be a good human being. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. So, um, there's so many questions I want to ask you and so little time to ask. Oh, it's okay. I, yeah. You know, we got to do a part two is what we got to do. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> totally done. <laughs> we got to do a part two. Yeah, I'm in. Yep. So um, I guess, like, what are some of the lessons you learned while you were iterating this project? Like, what are some of the things that didn't work the first time? Oh, and my how do God. How do you make it work? <laughs> and, like, I mean, that's – I know that could be a rabbit hole for, like, three hours, but – I love yeah. I love hearing people's mistakes and lessons learned. Right. So at a high level, we every project has a lessons learned log. Like that's one of the first logs we create is lessons learned. So we don't repeat the same thing over again, right? Smart. Um and then we review that once a week. In addition to that I should start reviewing if, mine once a week. <laughs> yeah. With the team. Um and then in addition to that, we will when we go to like the field, like field testing, we have a field test log. So as things come up on the field, we write, we document lessons Smart. learned, issues, risks, stuff like that. Anyways, I've got, since we started, we have, uh, we've done eight or nine projects over the past six years. And we, so we have that many logs and that many logs, there's probably 40 or 50 lessons learned at each log. That's and, awesome. but if you like, how do you amalgamate highest, those? Well, yeah. yeah, you mean you, before every project, we look at past ones. Like nice. when we're planning, don't do this stupid stuff. Like, don't be dumb. Yeah. Don't do this stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I would say the, uh, we kind of talked about it earlier. The biggest thing, one of the biggest lessons learned is, you know, it's even in our ethos now is do less and obsess. Do your lane as best as you can and obsess over it and then go to the next thing. When, when you like start to parse out so many different things and get kind of caught up in so many different um, endeavors, nothing is really getting done. Everything becomes horizontal instead of like vertical, you know, growth wise. So makes sense. that's like one of the biggest lessons is, you know, um, focusing the other, the other big lesson in product development is having, and this is like rudimentary and it's, it's hard to do, believe it or not, having all of the CAD models and even parts that you're trying to integrate your technology on. <laughs> <laughs> from the beginning of the project. Probably easier said than done with a military. Oh, it is industrial so complex. hard. Yes. <laughs> we, we have built a reputation that we're, when we ask for it, we get it now. But early on, we'd have to wait three or four months into a project to get the hardware. Fucking and hell. then when you get it, you're like, oh, crap, this doesn't fit because the CAD model doesn't match the part. <laughs> right so that's, that's brutal. brutal yeah yeah, yeah. well and, and even if you have the cad <laughs> models the problem is like what if your cad's not accurate yeah like, exactly we had something happen recently at work where like we got a cad model and we're like oh oh crap there's there's a lip that's not modeled what else isn't modeled right right Do we trust this cad at all yep. you know <laughs> <So>. yep. <clears throat> yeah that that was like yeah. the biggest thing and like it's so 
that that it, it's it seems so simple and rudimentary but it is hard to do it and even i bet you in the civilian world it's kind of hard to do you oh, don't for get, sure you don't get all the information well, up front. that's absolutely right it's pulling teeth <laughs> like i i made a client wait around um like this was maybe a few weeks ago but like i kept one of the engineers from a client like in a meeting for like an extra like 30 minutes i'm like i want your cad and he's like you know i'll get it to you i'm like no 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 no, no. right now i got time i've here's our Dropbox link, upload it this minute because mm -hmm. otherwise it's never going to happen and we're yeah. going to be late on your delivery. So mm -hmm. like, I'll wait, you know, and we'll, we'll get this done. Yep. But uh, yeah, so we, we call it form fit function 3F. So form, does it form well? Does it fit well? Is it going to function? Right. So yeah, that's the biggest thing is um, having that information, all the information you can have up front. Do you so, ever like just go on the vehicle and make your own CAD model? Because we, go we do, yeah. In fact, uh, sometimes the government will give us what we need, and we have they they can't give us the CAD files because it's owned by uh, whoever owns the technology package. So they're like, well, we own the vehicle, so here's the vehicle, and you know, if you need model to 3D it. scan or map, model it, because that's the only way you can you can you know build it out. So, oh geez, yeah, You've got a non cooperative. Um, well, it's not non-cooperative. It's like legit legal. You can't oh, pass the data. Yeah. So um, you have to do it off of hardware. So, yeah. you know, and if we can't get it from the government for data rights, it's fine. We, you know, if we can find, if they can give us an NSN, we can buy it ourselves, which we've done early on nice. um, on several projects. Is they give us the NSN. Since we're a defense contractor, we can buy it through the DLA. And then we have that part in house. Awesome. And Defense then, Logistics Agency for people listening. That's right. Yep. So <laughs> the, the the one project in particular was the medium tactical vehicle replacement MTVR for the Marine Corps. We couldn't get a hub, so we bought one. And funny thing was, when we bought it, it came in pieces. <laughs> so we had one schematic, and we had to figure out how to build this hub. Nice. And we did it, but it took like several days because the bearings, here's the, here's the other funny part. The bearings were needle bearings and they weren't assembled. Wait, so you, you, you had to individually put Jesus. the needle bearings in. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you had to put together needle. Yeah. Who the hell ships an unassembled <laughs> needle roller bearing? That is ridiculous. Yeah, that was that was fun. You couldn't, but we did it. Call McMaster car? We, we became, yeah, we became uh, great. I mean, we became like self-trained you know, hub technicians. <laughs> who, who is shipping on a simple needle bearing? That is so, that is like, that is like, yep. okay, we, we've got, here are the balls for your ball bearing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You put like together the desk chair. Like caster. I said, we, the, the whole hub had like, like 20 plus NSNs. Right. Yeah. And we just said, order everything. Right. Like, cause we didn't know, like just order everything, make sure we have everything. And it, that's how it came. Yeah. So I'm sure there were probably groups that we kind of like missed, like, Instead of just the individual NSN, get the group. But yeah. to your point, an NSN is like an end. I like it's it's a what does part, NSN stand for? A national stock number. Got it. Yeah. So it should just be a complete part. So it's like a um, it's like a <laughs> stock keeping unit for the so, DLA. Yeah. So if we when we when we sell kits, our brake pad is going to have an NSN. Yeah. So you can buy the brake pad. The rotor is going to have an NSN, so rotor. that you can buy. You the guys kit is going to the parts. kit is going to have a group. Yeah. Because it's made up of several NSNs. Yeah. Now, the DLA can dictate, like, hey, no, you're going to have to buy a whole kit at a time. But it doesn't make sense to do that, right? Because we're, we're, the replacement parts are what are, are the things that should have NSNs, like brake pads and rotors. Because they're going to yeah. get replaced. The calipers aren't going to get replaced. I know, really so. want to do a whole other episode with you where we just talk about um, sort of the, some of the similarities and differences between business to government and business oh, to yeah, business. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because... Yeah, B to G, B to B. And so yes. it'll, be, it'll be interesting <laughs> gonna to be get great. into that. <laughs> yes. That's going to be great. Yep. Yeah. And, we, and we have to talk about the flying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, I want to I hear why I shouldn't do it because I'm, I'm starting to get I'm going to take flying lessons after being out oh, with Alex Fossil. Oh, so much fun. Yeah, he's he's a, a great dude. I'll, I'll have to introduce you to him sometime. But awesome. But yeah, it, I, I really enjoyed it when he took me out. Yep. Yeah. All awesome. Right. So we should probably cut it, give it a yeah. timeline. Yeah. But uh, is there anything up. you want to plug like before we kill it? Like, no, man, I, I'm just, uh, it's awesome to be here to do cool stuff like this. Yeah. Uh, fellowship, uh, camaraderie and, and just uh, go through the battle wounds, but also the successes and just continue to build, you know, help people 
help themselves do great things. And, um, it's great that we could do this here in Pennsylvania and, yeah. uh, it's just going to keep getting bigger. So amen. Pleasure yeah. hanging out with you. Thank you. Thanks brother. Thank you, man. Yep. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.